Hey, Pepin. There once was a man named John. Whoa. Tell me about John. John was a farmer. He was eating crops. Those crops turned into rabies. And John died. <gasps> wow. I was enthralled by that story. But then he came back as a zombie. <gasps> Whoa. Plot twist. Plot twist. Plot. That was like probably the greatest story I've ever come up with. Nate, we need to talk. <laughs> Welcome back. So glad you guys could join us. I am here once again with my best friend, Nathan Pepin. How's it going today, Pepin? That's a very abrupt, we need to talk. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm doing well. How about, you, how about you, Meter? Well, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the best story you've ever come up with. What? Are you serious? Remember? Yeah, I remember uh, Cold Comfort. That's the best story you've ever come up with. Okay, that was a group effort, and it was amazing. Uh, what was that well, story about again? It was about a clown whose dad dies, and then he is depressed and snorts the ashes, and then... Oh, he gets that one little blood has a trip. <laughs> he has a trip and maybe dies? I don't know. Oh, yeah. It becomes like a baby maybe at one it point. Was him, it was him all along. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah that, that was... That's actually on YouTube, so uh, just search Cold Comfort, and you won't find it. So Cold Comfort Nathan Pepin, I guess, and maybe you will find it. Uh, it's, it's the animation that did. Uh, actually, Steve did a lot of the artwork, too, and uh, uh, it, it's actually pretty great. All the music Cold was composed by me. Comfort Pepin. And then it's the first the first choice. And it has 100% upvotes. Oh. Yeah. How many views? 80. Yes. <laughs> From 10 years ago. That's We get eight per year. Less than one per month views. Very, very impressive. Making up stories, I think, is very, very interesting. And it, it's, I think, a bit of improv, a bit of thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't know. Sometimes I make up stories in my head just for the heck of it. And I think it can be a lot of fun. How about yourself, Peter? Definitely. Yeah, I make up stories all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I suppose you do it a bit with uh, when you're doing the dungeon mastering for D and D. Uh, you would yeah. kind of create stories. Like uh, there's an episode on this show actually where we did a one shot adventure, and you kind of came up with a story for that. So that's mm -hmm. something you've done actually. I'm gonna say somewhat professionally. I mean, I don't know about professionally, but one of the campaigns I ran was a year and a half long, um, and that was three hours per week for a year and a half. So. That was one very long story that had an, an arc in it and it had some sub arcs in it. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the important aspects of creating like a story like that? Is it something that you kind of like do in the seat of your pants or do you have like an overarching idea that began it? It started with a very rough skeleton outline and then uh, it fleshed out over time um and then there was also the input of the characters as the characters all needed their own arcs in there and then um trying to tie everything together at the end to say like how did all of this work hmm. Hmm. Yeah, i guess there's like a lot of factors here but i guess it's kind of like a an evolution of things too because you're not having to come up with anything like you don't have the front load at all right there Maybe you front load right. some of it, but you can kind of figure things out as it comes. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that was definitely what, what the whole thing was. And I didn't have full say over the story either. Like the players got to choose what they wanted to do in situations and that could change the story over time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. There, I, I think it's a very interesting aspect of story making, which is kind of like, Part of it's improv, but part of it's thinking it out, and it, it's something I think is very, very enjoyable. Sometimes what happened with myself, and I'm not like great at coming up with stories, but sometimes I get like an idea for something, but then I can fit everything around that one idea, and it just kind of falls in. Like I had this idea for like a whole st movie type idea plot thing that kind of centers around like a idea about conscious death. And 
I was able to like take that idea and kind of just make it into like this this uh, this thing. And I haven't actually published that or anything, but uh, it, it is kind of one of those things where sometimes you just get one thing, everything else fits into place. Yeah. And that, that is interesting because like that's what happened with with the campaign too is I didn't know how it was going to end. Um, and I had a super rough idea of kind of what I wanted, but I ended up changing it a couple of times throughout to kind of fit other things that had happened and other seeds that I planted early and tie the let like actually reap the the benefit of the seeds that I had planted very early on. And when making a story, I like to leave a lot of little threads just kind of laying out there that way later on if i need to or want to or it makes sense i can pull on those threads and tie them to something else and kind of make something out of all of these little threads that are just laying all over the place Mm -hmm. i suppose part of that is like if you leave enough seeds like people may not recognize those are seeds necessarily and then when Mm -hmm. they kind of look back you know and say oh he planned us all out where it's like, you know, I, I kind of did a little bit, like I threw these seeds out there, but, you know, you didn't see the 20 seeds that actually didn't come to being like full plants or full fruit. Yeah. And, and maybe that's part of how it happens too. Yeah. And I mean, there's some seeds that turn, you know, end up being used in a smaller way and then some seeds that end up being used in a bigger way and then some that end up like being a core part of the story in and of itself some of them are you know uh, an ends to to justify but some of them are like the actual thing itself mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what i've heard some of this being described as like in like as far as like writing a book and stuff is there's, there's like kind of two different mindsets there's like the person who will like plant seeds and they're planting them from themselves more so because uh, like George R. R. Martin, for instance, he's more of like a, a planter. Like he'll just plant a bunch of ideas and kind of let that kind of fester in his mind. And eventually he just starts writing and it kind of just comes out. Whereas other people are more like architects where they have the whole like plan there drafted in front of them. And now they just need to like, uh, just, you know, implement that plan by building it. And people will probably be more in the middle of those, like having some architecture, but some, you know, natural like a uh, thing. But th- there are those extremes too. I- I'd probably say I'm more on the architect side of things, but uh, I-, I-, I don't think it makes sense to like architect out like the little details, like like that, th- that stuff you can just do in the moment. But then again, I don't know. That, that-, that story I was talking about that I was making up, I- like I have a lot of the little details like architected out in my head because c- they're somehow important. So you would probably describe yourself more as a uh, a planter than a architect, I would assume. Then, yeah, no, for sure, it's hard for me to conceptualize like all the little aspects and stuff, and I want to get so much into a story. So I definitely like to have a lot of a lot of wiggle room, a lot of room to play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm not afraid for the plan to change throughout. Do you think there's a difference in quality between the two types of stories? Like the two different approaches? No. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like there can be to some degree, but it's hard to know. Because th- this is the big question for myself. Is there's a lot of media and TV shows or wh- whatever where there's early foreshadowing on ideas and there's big payoffs. And you can't get those payoffs without the big foreshadowing, the big ideas there. But sometimes it just happens out that way. And I don't know if, like, the writer had, like, a, like, like they're doing things subconscious, like, the subconscious thought there that's kind of guiding them and they're just not aware of it or, or what exactly. Like, like, I think my biggest example here is uh, with the show Dragon Ball Z uh, or Dragon Ball. But uh, the author, Kira Toriyama, he came up with this whole series, uh, spoilers a little bit, but uh, there's a whole like android saga where it's like the androids came and then they started destroying things. And then we find out, hey, it's not androids. It's uh, this weird creature thing. Oh, actually, it's from the future, blah, blah, blah. And kind of just keeps evolving over time. And it ends up in this kind of like weird kind of a or interesting kind of like meta narrative on like uh, androids and kind of future sorts of thing. I mean, I'm, I'm getting very vague here because I'm not trying to spoil anything, but it, it, it kind of seems like it was meant to be designed that way, the way things play out. But when you 
actually realized the real story of it. He came up with this idea about androids, and then his editor didn't like the idea because the two antagonists were just like two brats, they were called. And then he came up with the other villain idea, and it's like, he just looks like a bug. Like, this is not gonna work out. And so he just had them having to evolve the idea because his editor didn't like his ideas. But the way it mm-hmm. played out is this, it just had this huge meta narrative sort of aspect to it. So the question there for me is, was there some sort of guiding force there behind it, that, that initial impetus? Or was he just very good at like playing off his previous moves? I mean, there's no there's no way to know the answer to something like that. Because one, you're saying it was that subconscious, and how do you, how do you pinpoint if something was subconsciously done or not? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. I I feel like you can a little bit. Like if it's just, I guess it's the improbability of something coming out, which was not somewhat directed. I I could think of a conversation I've had with you a while back, but maybe this isn't accurate, but. We're talking about your writing process for uh, some of your songs. And your songs, I think, had, or one of your songs had like a very like uh, interesting plot progression, if that makes any sense, or very interconnectedness. And what you told me is that the words just kind of came out to you, or you just kind of like just started just writing what came to your head. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you got back at the end, or when you started what you, what you wrote, you're like, oh, hey, this all kind of connects together, strangely enough. Mm hmm. And that I feel like you could say it's it's kind of improbable or unlikely that if there wasn't that subconscious force that things would connect in that way. It'd rather just be like this unconnected gibberish. I mean, maybe, yeah, yeah. I think you make you make a very good point there. Um, unconnected gibberish, but I, maybe if you're not thinking of it as all being connected, you do think of it that it's unconnected gibberish Mm -hmm. what's the difference between actually understanding a story and not understanding a story maybe there's story in a lot of different places that we think are unconnected that aren't i suppose it's the ability to perceive the connections or yeah relation to those things both yeah I mean, sometimes I feel like with certain plots, there is an idea the author's trying to get across, but they don't do a very good job of conveying it, or there is like those minor impetuses, but you know, it doesn't, it just seems like out of left field. I mean, that always feels like a difficult thing though, when you're writing something is like doing so in a way that isn't going to beat people over the head, but also isn't going to completely miss them. And that's a, like a fine line to walk and sometimes an impossible one because so many people are different that some people are going to get something that other people aren't going to get. And like, who is your audience? Uh, will your audience get it or will they completely miss it? Will anybody get it? And I, I feel like that's a, a fear of a lot of creators is like, no one's going to get this mm-hmm. because it's too in my own head type of type of way to write something. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like the best plot twist is one that's really obvious in hindsight, but was impossible to guess still. And that's really hard to write because when you're writing it, you're like, okay, this is way too obvious. Like everyone's going to like if you've ever written a and d puzzle of any sort or a video game or whatever, any puzzle for somebody else to try and solve, you're always like, this is so obvious. They're going to get this immediately. They never do. <laughs> it's it's only obvious when you already know the answer and it's hard to write something that way. It's easier to write that way because I wrote that into one of my campaigns that like, there this thing has that was from the very very beginning ends up being a really important thing at the very end and in hindsight it's like oh wow we had all of these clues but that connection didn't actually exist until i wrote it like months 
after the events had actually happened. So I didn't even know that those were all connected until they were connected. Hmm. So like the, I plot twisted myself <laughs> and then was able to, to actually put that into the story and be like, wow, it would be really cool if this was the case. Hmm. And now if I ever run that campaign again, I'm going to do the same thing and hopefully I don't give it away. But that's the way I th I'm, I'm feeling is like, oh, people are going to like, it's going to be so obvious. Now I feel that way, even though if I ran it the exact same way, it would have the same effect. Mm -hmm. But to me, it seems obvious. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, that's a... That's a tough sort of thing, because it, 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 is is it the fact that it seems obvious to you that makes it obvious, or is it the way you're present? Ah, what what is that exactly? Because yeah. I feel the same way. But, will but it, will me knowing about it change the way I present it and hmm. make it too obvious? Yeah, or will it have no effect, but uh, you just kind of be on board with it. I guess if it could also, I could be overly concerned about being too obvious and then not be obvious enough. And then it doesn't have the effect because mm -hmm. it's too subtle. Yeah. yeah th th there was a episode of uh, the Spooty Ones, D and D Adventures or something like that. I don't know. He had a video series. Yeah. Uh, Spooty Ones, a great YouTube channel. Uh, check him out. Co Counter Monkey and Spoonie's awful. But go on. Ah, god damn it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, he had. A series where he talked about like uh, some adventures or whatever but anyway there's a story about how he tried to come up with these plot twists and he gave one example of one where it's like it's like a detective sort of game and uh they uh, there's a scene where the, one of the characters is in the hospital and then he sees this other guy like across from him and the other guy just says like one or two words and then somehow th this player is just like oh I, th th that's the person who did it right there and Spoonie was just like, uh, I, 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 he got really mad because he's like, how did he figure it out? This is stupid. Like, I wasn't trying to give him any hints, but somehow he just metagamed it like completely and just figured it out right there. And, and I guess that's just a sort of a meta narrative kind of like a uh, plan you can do because you can assume that if something is architected in this sort of way, that if there's a detail given that that detail will be paid off in some sort of way, like why would it be mentioned otherwise? It, it, it may be part of like uh, maybe part of like obfuscating that plot twist might just be a matter of fact of just giving details that you don't know are going to interplay later or not because mm. me the problem is he made a point to make that point about that guy being in the hospital yeah but that's yeah I mean maybe there was I think I think there's a lot of ways to to obscure that though. Like you can smoke screen with red herrings, um, throw in other things that seem obvious. So that way, you know, now you have three things that seem obvious. Uh, in the Adventure Zone, the McElroy Brothers D and D podcast, they did a, a train uh, like mystery. It's a Murder on the Rockport Limited. It was a there was a murder that happened on a train, and they had to figure it out and in it the murder that happened the person was had their head cut clean off uh and their hands were like sawn off with like something more blunt and there was somebody on the train named Jess the beheader so like you know that's so obvious that it's not obvious right because like obviously you're gonna think the person whose name is the beheader and this person died by beheading like okay the beheader did it obviously but that's such a strong red herring that now you're like, okay, there's no way it's her. So then once again, you wrap back around to, okay, maybe it is her because it's so obvious that there's no way that it is, that maybe it is. And you end up like doing a loop in on yourself. It wasn't in the long run, but it was just enough obviousness to cast the doubt that if there were other things that were more obvious or maybe equally obvious, they would fit into that same group you know mm -hmm. you'd be like okay here are all the possibilities and now you're giving them an obvious possibility to put into that bag that you know they won't miss that way if they come up with other obvious things they can be like okay well but also this and this and this mm -hmm. hmm. so you're giving other plausible possibilities also you can kind of 
trolls are metagaming in some sort of way. Because if, if, if the obvious choice, or, or if the stupidly obvious choice is such an obvious choice, then obviously they're not going to do that. But I know these people, they actually might troll us. Maybe that is the actual person. So maybe it's a reverse troll sort of there. And it kind of kind of yeah. goes like that. So you, yeah, you control the metagamer there. And at least it gives, you know, it gives more things to look at. And it force you know, you're guaranteed that they're going to look at that. And uh, in doing so, it, it at least casts a little bit of extra thought, mm-hmm. even if they throw it out and they're like, this is the obvious red herring. You know, maybe you put two red herrings in. Mm-hmm. What? There can't be two. Mm-hmm. And it ends up being communism all along. Sounds about right. So we're going to end this episode right here because we're running out of episodes and I'm running out of time for editing and stuff at the moment. So, hey, next time on We Need to Talk, part two of our talk about whatever we're talking about. I honestly forgot because we need to talk.